So again, uh, thanks very much to Ansible for the sponsorship. Um, would you guys like to talk for a few minutes? Oh, sure. Okay. This uh, mic is very wide, so okay. be careful. <laughs> Hi, I'm Brittany. I work with Ansible. We're actually in Durham, North Carolina, at the American Tobacco Campus. Um, we're, we like to say we're the simple way to automate. And I have t-shirts. Who <laughs> 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 wants t-shirts? Uh, or should, maybe we should let Joseph... Let's do a quiz at the end. Yeah. Okay, well, here you go. So, and that's all. Yeah. Rewards for asking good questions, right? Right. Thanks, Brittany. Absolutely. And we really appreciate the time. I don't think there's another slide. I think I'm handing it off to you here. Yeah. Okay. Welcome, Joseph Tate, Steering Committee Emeritus. <laughs> So I'm going to preface this whole thing by saying this is my opinion. I do not work for Ansible. <laughs> I have worked with people who work for Ansible, um, but you know this is this is kind of what I have learned in the last uh, 14 months or so working with with Ansible. Is it the opinion of your company? This is the opinion of me, and since I'm the system administrator of my company, yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, actually, since it's can everybody hear me okay? I'm kind of, I project, but, okay. Uh, actually, my company is called Crunch.io, and we are hiring JavaScript developer. If you uh, are very strong with um, in full MVC JavaScript in the browser, I'd like to talk to you. Okay, so I'm Joseph Tate. I ran the, uh, I was on the security committee for, I think, from 2002 to 2004. I was the, publication, uh, uh, the publicity chair. Um, I was known for witty and sometimes funny uh, announcements, emails that came across. Um, all right. OK. So I'm, uh, I'm going to just jump in and say, you know, like I said, this is my opinion of what Ansible is and how to use it. If Michael was up here, he'd probably give a completely different presentation, but that's OK. Um, Ansible is a cross between a configuration management tool like, um, like I guess there's a CMS engine or something, and then CF engine, and a remote system administration module like Puppet. So it's a it's a merger, uh, like a merger between Puppet and CF engine. Um, you use Ansible to control sets of machines uh, in a stateful repeatable and reliably ordered uh, way. And as kind of a general rule, you declare final state rather than saying, how do I get there? So, so the idea is you say, I want this service restarted. And that means something rather than saying, if the server isn't started, start it. If the server is started, restart it. You know, that kind of logic in, in a big old script. So what can you do with Ansible? Out of the box, Ansible lets you deploy configuration changes, um, set up syscontrol kernel uh, settings, services, database management, DNS management, um, start and stop cloud instances, and a lot more. Uh, so let's look at, this is where I uh, learn uh, Jack's system here. Uh, uh, caps locks J. I got to get to the terminal? Yeah. Yeah, caps locks J. Okay. So um, let's look at something just really simple. So, so by default, oh, that looks pretty. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Jack, you should have put it. <laughs> getting bigger. <laughs> you should have put it in Dvorak for added effects. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 
Okay, so this is a set of commands that are run against a remote service just to figure out what's going on there. Okay, <coughs> so it tells me what my IP addresses are, um, what my architecture looks like. Um, this is less and I can't space. Really? That's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, you got to go down. Try return. Yeah. Do you need someone to type for you, like Jack? Yeah, yeah Jack. You may be doing This is my problem. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it tells me what uh, what kernel I'm running, uh, what the day is. I think you're in that right or maybe perhaps it's mine too. Yeah. Yeah, the internet's not working. So do you, you have hard coded DNS? Uh. Oh yeah. <laughs> you have no DNS. <laughs> <laughs> and eight dot eight dot eight dot eight. No, that no, won't work. work. So um, do you want to see the master because I? Uh, we're on NCSU. Okay. What are we just? But wait, should now we got more? Oh, we get to that side so I got the date, I've got um, a set of devices, I've got <coughs> more devices, I've got a distribution, I've got some environment variables, I've got, um, well, um, where, where it gets it really interesting is down here in the Ansible, um, like Ethernet. So I, anyway, I get lots of d uh, details about the system that I'm connecting to. All of these details become variables available in my Ansible commands. Um, so I can reference this, the interfaces, I can reference the kernel version, I can reference um, the number of CPUs. How'd you get this? Did we miss that? Or did I miss that? This, is, this is run on every Ansible command. You run an Ansible command uh, and it asks for these things from the remote server. And that's, as root. that's like step zero. Yeah. Well, no, you don't have to. Like any user. You can connect as root. You can connect as a regular user in sudo. Um, you can connect as a regular user. You just won't get all of this stuff. You'll get actually all of these are are available. It interrogates the box and brings back all this info. Yes. Mm -hmm. So is the agent running on the on the remote? No. 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 No remote deployed. Are you just directly accessing the, the slash proc? Uh, it, it drops an it drops a script in to a temporary directory and SSH executes it, <coughs> and then sends the sends the result back as a JSON set. Is it vulnerable to Heartbleed? <laughs> <laughs> Is SSH? <laughs> Brian, you got a hand up. You just answered it. Okay. okay. Uh, come on. Okay. <laughs> so uh, here's here's one where where you, you, this is this is something that I've used in one of my uh, Ansible playbooks is uh, and we'll talk about what that is later. But um, I'm taking the number of cores, the number of processors, and the number of threads per core, and I'm multiplying all three of those terms, to keep those those variables together to get a total number of um, processes that I should launch. <laughs> For my Daemon application, so that Python has a global, global interpreter lock. Essentially, I can do on this machine. I can do two processes simultaneously without having any um, any paging collisions. Okay. So host keys. Quickly, someone take a picture of us. <laughs> yeah, they're public keys. <laughs> 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 Uh, and MAC addresses, yeah, well, okay. This is not a local box, so. <laughs> okay, um, so what that looks like. So that's what, that's, that's, that's called the setup module. Um, it's run as, as step zero 
when you string together a bunch of Ansible commands. Unless you turn it off. Hmm? Unless you turn it off. Unless you turn it off, right. But it's hella useful. <laughs> okay. Um, so, great. What? What now? Uh, so Ansible commands, you can string them together use it, uh, call it, uh, with something called a playbook. Um, playbooks let you build up a simple set of tasks that, that give you a way to start from ground zero, start from some base image, or start from you know, some, some root install, and ap apply all of the changes, the software, the settings, the networking configurations, the routes, everything that you need to get your application up and running as a single step. Um, for example, you might have a LAMP app and you, so you create a, a playbook for, for the Apache layer, you create a, pl a playbook for your MySQL, your database level, and you create a playbook for your, your Python or PHP or Perl layer, and then you combine them together into a single playbook to <coughs> let you create flexible deployments, say, so development can have a single machine box, but production can have database servers and web servers and, and all of those be separate machines. I see a hand. Real quick, back to step zero. Um, does that play friendly with Amazon EC2 instances? Absolutely. Okay. Okay, so first, inventories. The way that all of that works, all of those magic, uh, you know, production versus develop versus um, staging or whatever, all or all of the different environments work is through inventories. Inventory is a flat INI file format that lets you um, list the servers in your inventory and and set variables per server um, and to group them in various ways. Uh, groups typically follow. Geography, like you can say, all the machines in one data center are in one group. All the machines in an Amazon region are in another group. All the machines that are in a availability zone in Amazon are in another group. And you can create these multiple hierarchies of all of these systems. Can um, the groups be over, can the groups overlap? Yes. And you can nest them. So you can say uh, you have a southeast region and then a northeast region, and a midwest region, and you can combine all of these into a US region. Or you could say Asia Pacific <coughs> region would have you know, a separate set of group of things. Um, and, and since machines can be in multiple category or multiple hierarchies, you can say my database server is in the database server group, which means that if I change some database setting, I can run my Ansible playbook that's per, uh, pertinent to the, that all of the database servers has a single chunk. Or I can say, well, I'll get this on the next, well, one of the next slides. I'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> so uh, an inventory looks like this. It's one, it has three line types. You have the, the typical INI file of grouping, and then um, a listing of host name, and then optionally some variables that apply just to that host. Um, you can also use some shortcuts to, to specify a range, like 3 to 30 is, is server S3 to S30. You don't have to type out every single one. And then uh, that metagroup colon children lets you create supergroups, groups of groups. Brian. The Variable equals value part of one of those lines that's specific to that group. So if s one that example that come with another group, it could have a different set of variable equal values that would apply when that group is being used. Yes. However, um, except in very rare cases, you don't want to set variables here. And I'll show you why in a minute. Okay, so like I mentioned, you can use uh, brackets to specify ranges. Um, best practice for my from my point of view, is to define hosts once, maybe using a uh, a very fine-grained host-specific group or host set, or if you have a set of, like, say, a set of database servers that serve the same purpose but are in some kind of um, scalable arrangement, 
you might group all of those together as a single entity and then use that that entity to create multiple hierarchies um, and like, like I said earlier hierarchies typically you want them to follow both geography and application layer um, yeah so um, it's not really like um, now you would do it, right? Where you would have something you can inherit. You're actually creating whole new structures. You can't just inherit from here and then you know, so you get closer to the actual object you use those variables. Well, variables do scale across, or do do follow the hierarchies. So you can set up variables that, that attach at different points of your hierarchy. So you can set up host specific variables and group specific variables and super group specific variables and they have a, an override structure. Um, and I'll show you that in just a second. Um, so my suggestion is you keep all variables besides your ansible underscore blah, which is like how do you connect to this machine out of your, out of your inventory files. Um, so Ansible SSH user, you might want to specify if you need to connect to an Amazon AMI instance, for example, you'd use EC2 user instead of root as your connection user. And you'd also need to use sudo, whereas if you're using the, the base Ubuntu image, you can log in as root and don't need sudo. So you would specify those machines that you, that are maybe different from normal, you would specify those Ansible connection variables inside your inventory files, but leave everything else out. That's, that's my suggestion anyway. So what, that, what does that look like? Um, okay. All right, so I've got, So, um, <clears throat> oh, I'm, I'm jumping the gun. All right, so, sorry, I'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> All right, so what, um, in, inventory lets you slice and dice, okay? If you set up your hierarchies uh, to be both geographic and application layer uh, specific, then you could say, um, I just want a new NTP server, upstream server in the Northern Virginia data center. And every machine in the Northern Virginia data center should get this new NTP provider. Or you can say, <laughs> I'm gonna open I'm gonna update OpenSSL on all my mail servers and restart SMTDD. Why? What would And you can do that with a single inventory file, yeah. and you can you can uh, you can you can filter the the hosts that you're going to operate against on the command line. Okay, so um, this is the way that I do handle. I, so what I have in my let me explain a little bit about about my company and what we're building. We're building a a web application that consists of a homegrown database, a uh, Python application layer on the web server, web server side, proxy behind Nginx um, on EC2 with load balancers and all those things, okay? I have a handful of developers all over the globe, well, the hemisphere, really. I have one in Peru, for example, one in Alaska, one in New York City, one in St. George, Utah, one in, yeah, anyway, <laughs> distributed across the globe. Some of them run Linux as their primary machines. Some of them run Mac as their primary machines. Some of them run Windows. Um, I have to, I'm the, I'm the systems guy, I have to keep all the servers running. I have to keep, I have to push all the server code updates and I have to support all the developer machines <coughs> and their development environment. Um, Ansible is supported by Vagrant, which makes my job a lot easier. With the same set 
with the same playbook, I can say to a developer, run the NISVEGR command, and you get a fresh Vagar instance with all of our software installed and configured and ready to run. All you have to do is replace the system instances with your checked out copy, and you're ready to run. I can also say to Jenkins, which runs our continuous automation and build, I can say, when you have finished building all of the software and running <coughs> all of the tests, push this up to our test farm so that it's ready to run. Same script, or the same Ansible playbook. Um, and I can do that because I have these hierarchies set up in, in the new inventory files. And I can set up variable hierarchies to match those inventory hierarchies. So now, okay, so, so what that looks like here is, so here's an imaginary um, directory hierarchy um, for a, a, an Ansible project. Uh, you might have an Ansible directory. Under that, you'd have an inventories directory. And under that, you'd have a group bars or host bars directory. Host bars would contain host specific variables. Group bars contains group specific variables with a special group called all. All contains every group and is the first to be overridden. So you can set up all default values in this all group and then pick and choose which ones are different for a different environment. <coughs> now I'll show you what I'm Can you set up that? quote unquote all at each hierarchy. In other words, have a have a base set of defaults, have group type level defaults on that, and then specific defaults for it. You yes. can set up uh, so it <coughs> variables apply in least specific to most specific. That's what I was asking. So and you can override variables on the command line. There's, I'll get to that in a minute, how you can override these variables. Um, but there's a specific deterministic way to override the variables so that you can do pretty much anything you want. So here, for example, are settings that I use in my environments. Okay, so I've got, so, so just a note here, the stuff in curly braces are variable replacements. Um, so, for example, public host name comes from an inventory. It happens to be the, the, or actually, let's see. Ew, public host name is, sorry, I'm gonna scroll down. Inventory host name comes from what machine are you connecting to as it, out, of your, out of your inventory file. In this, in this case, my default public host name is the inventory host name. But if, for example, I've got a web server farm and they're all the home behind a load balancer that answers to a single host name, I can override that. And I'll show you how that's done in a minute. I have the port that I listen to. I have maybe my public URL because, you know, reverse proxying message does, wreaks all kinds of havoc with, with uh, host names. Um, I have a directory. I have, you know, a bunch of Oh, there's some stuff you're not supposed to see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. So, uh, and this is my production uh, box, and it says, um, instead of using my inventory host name, I'm going to use beta.crunch.io as my public host name, and then substitute that through. Um, I have a real host name that I'm going to be setting to beta backend, uh, uh, whatever. Um, and then I'm going to do some a little bit of Python to take whatever host name that was and reverse the octets or reverse the, the the quads or whatever you call that. We take it, split it by the dots, reverse it, and put it back together with the dots. So that's what that line of code does. Um, we call it public name host, host name name host. All right, and I use that for I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I use my repo, my repo label is production instead of dev. My JIT, Git branch is master instead of dev. Um, data dog monitoring is on. Trace blockbacks are hidden. 
I have a central log server, you know, all those kinds of things. But then you look at the vagrant, and it just says, you know, my local host name is local My public URL now has a colon eight four four three because of port forwarding garbage. I'm using a self-signed certificate instead of uploading my own certificate. Um, Vagrant is a kind of flag on or off, and then I'm listening now to port 8443 instead of the default 443. And so um, with these variable hier hierarchies, I can, um, I, can I can handle all of the variations on all of the machines. Um, any questions about this so far, yeah. So, so the, are these the actual playbooks, or are these just? No, these are just variable definitions. These are, these are just definitions that can be used by the playbook set. Right. Okay. All right. So every single one of these left side before the colon are available to me later on in an actual playbook. This is the environment. This is environment initialization. Yeah. This is where you say you limit dash n is 65k instead of 12. Well, <laughs> this is where you, you, you say shared memory size is two gigabytes instead of... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is, you know, this is, this is where you, you set all of those variables that... And in, for example, back here, um, I'm setting up the number of processes as the number of cores times the number, the number of chips times the number of threads per core, and that's the number of processes that I can launch. So you can do you can do more than just um, more than just define. You can actually do some calculations with facts that you determine through your little step zero of your high school. Okay. Okay. So that's variables, Pre precedents. Um, these are from most sticky to least sticky. So in other words, order from what you'd expect to see. <laughs> um, if you have variables defined in your roles, and we'll, ex we'll I'll explain what a role is in a little bit, then they were the first to go when the when the draft is called. Um, or <laughs> they're the first to go when the, the names are called. All right, the facts. Discovered from the remote system or the next to go. Um, group variables go next. In decreasing specificity, so a group variable would be, uh, group all would be overridden immediately by any other group, uh, which are all overridden by host variables, which is all overridden by dash E on the command line which says, this is the way. Um, generally, try to keep your variables defined in just a small number of places so that you don't have to look too many places to figure out which variable is overriding which other variable. Yeah. Do the groups apply, the group variables become less sticky as you go further down the grouping hierarchy? More specific groups will get Right, so the top level group all okay. will be overridden first. Okay. The next level group, southeast would get, or uh, US region would get overridden before a southeast, before a um, Atlanta versus Virginia, right? And you say specific, it's, it's how many levels nested deep these groups are? How much closer are you to the actual inclusion of the host name okay. in your group? So you have kind of, Host level groups that have only host names under them, and then you have these uh, groups of groups. Right, so these meta groups, which have meta group called children, which only list groups. So, so here, that first group is actually included in meta group one, and it could include other groups as well. Okay. Okay. So. I think we're pretty much uh, showing what kinds of things need variables. Um, <clears throat> so.
So variables let you handle variations without messing up, without lots of if-else branches again in a hairy script. All right, so that's all well and good, but let's get to the good stuff, right? We've been talking now for half an hour, and we haven't actually done anything yet. Okay, so here is a very, very simple playbook. Um, who can recognize the file format? YAML. YAML, okay, so it's not XML, it's not a lot of fluff, but it is white space dependent. Um, for As a quick primer for those who don't know YAML, um, a dash is like an entry at that indention level. So the whole thing is an entry and we call that entry a playbook. As itself is a self-contained chunk of, of playbook. It can be mixed and matched with other playbooks. Um, it can be used as a standalone. Each item that does not have a dash in front of it is a name, is like a key value pair for that entry. So host is the key and, and web servers is the value. Bars is the key and there's another indention there. That means there's another hash table or, or op, uh, uh, you know, name based array that says its entries are HTTP port and max clients. Um, remote user goes back to the root object and is the key and the root is the value and then we have tasks and this is the, this is this is where we get to the good stuff tasks then has a list of a list an ordered list of operations or states that you want to get to and they are executed in order according to the host that it matches so in this case, in only the inventory groups that match, only in the inventory host net hosts that are in the web servers group would actually execute this playbook. You can imagine a similar playbook <coughs> for a, a DB server, or if you had some kind of failover operation that you needed to, to do in a specific data center, um, you could imagine that that would be a geographic group instead of a an application level group. Then we, so the task is where kind of we really get some, some stuff done. Um, the first task is installs the latest version of HTTPD using YUM. Uh, the second task is to take a template file which can, has access to all of my facts and variables and write that to HTTP.com. Um, then I say, restart Apache. It doesn't actually restart at this point. It just notifies the system that later on, at the end of all of this, if something has changed, restart Apache. So if that file that's going to be replaced is the same file that was already there, it doesn't need to restart, and so the notification doesn't actually go. Yes. What would you do if you've got a situation where you're playing with multiple distributions, but you want to apply the same playlist at it. I'll get there. Okay. <laughs> I will get there. Comment on the, the change right quick or query as to maybe if I'm doing something wrong because I've used Ansible. From different geographic locations, my host name changes. That means the file changed because I put a tag of where okay. this came from to notify myself if I end up on that system. Oh, this is in fact Ansible managed. Okay. And so Apache does get restarted because I'm on a different network now when I push this new Ansible config. Am I doing something wrong with the, this tag? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> put a comment in the file. Yep. Yeah. Put another comment. All right. I mean, if, if that that would trigger a restart too, but I mean, you can you can leave your footprints in other ways that wouldn't. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, so then at the end we make sure that HTTP is started um, you know because if it's a fresh install by default it's turned off and it's not going to be running um, so we make sure that it's running at that point point. Um, and then there's a handler section the handlers are those um, event-driven tasks 
that, ha that get handled on <coughs> notifications. So um, here, where you have this restart Apache matches the name here, yep. and so causes that, uh, that module to be run at the end of the process. If the notification occurs, then Apache gets restarted. If it doesn't occur, nothing happens. If multiple things say restart Apache, you restart Apache one time at the very end. Let me ask you this. So the notify specifies what handler to run, yep. but what criteria does it use to determine when a notify should occur? Let's get to that in a minute. Okay. <laughs> yes. Suppose there was some situation, in particular, I'm thinking about upgrades, where you need to restart Apache at the point where you, well, no, but you're not doing. It's still using yum or apt or whatever to install the thing. Right. So it's going to, yum or apt or whatever is going to do whatever it does. So I don't need to do anything on the, on the yum line, right? I don't need to notify that Apache needs to restart because yum can handle that for me. Um, but when I change configuration, I need to handle it. That's my ball. The ball is my, in my court at that point, right? Uh, yes. How do you handle if you're supporting the same application on Ubuntu and CentOS? Do you have to have to I'm getting there. Okay. I'm getting there. <laughs> that was the question I was Everyone, asking. everyone stand back and get there. Okay. Uh, so the host section, we talked about that a little bit. Um, this lets you say, all this nginx crap doesn't belong on my database servers, and so I'm not going to touch. I'm not going to run this stuff on my database servers. I'm not going to run ba backups on my throwaway servers, or my you know. I'm not going to run. I'm I'm going to set up NTP on all of my file servers because you know bad things would happen. Um, I'm going to set up SNMP and remote logging only on my production servers. Okay, so that's what that host section. At the very top, that's what that does. Unless you list one or more groups that, that a, a playbook applies to. Um, we talk about handlers and tasks. How do you concatenate the multiple groups? Roles. Okay. Well, okay. So, so because this is not flat, this is nested, mm -hmm. I can say instead here, I'll show you. <laughs> uh, basically, you can say you can specify multiple groups in that host line. Okay, and exclude some too. If you want to do. And you can exclude. There is a, there's an exclude host. You can say okay everything but yep. this. Okay. Um, the tasks are the things to do. They they do happen in order. And use the modules to do the heavy lifting. Um, and then roles, which are not listed here, but um, roles are ways to group a bunch of tasks together into a repeatable chunk so that you can use them in multiple playbooks. I'll show that in a minute. Okay. Right now, actually. Um, so for me, roles typically follow layers in your application stack diagrams. So you have like a storage layer, in that storage layer, you might have database servers and file servers. So file servers might be one, ro one role, and database server might be another role. And then you might have a shared role between database and file that would be backups that would handle setting up backups or, or configuring um, failovers or, or whatever. Um, so you would set up a hierarchy of roles so that you can... <coughs> In the case of you ha of having a, sy a single machine installation, you can reuse those chunks to those those set of sets of tasks in multiple different ways. Um, you can say, if this machine is a developer machine, then I'm going to run all the web stack roles. I'm going to run all of the database stack roles. I'm going to run all of the um, whatever. I mean, run all of the all of the roles in all across all of the infrastructure in my production 
are going to all run on this single machine in the developer's virtual machine. Um, this is kind of tricky. Roles are just sets of tasks. Um, there are ways there, so, and they're grouped together in whatever seems logical to you and to your application and to your environment. Here you could have, if you wanted to, I'm not saying this is the right way to do it, I think the right way to do it is through include files, but for this particular way you could say, you could have your database dash Ubuntu role, database dash Fedora, and you could, you could break it up that way. Um, but I'll get to a better way in a minute for how you would do handle multiple different um, in, uh, operating systems. I just what was thinking about the fact that you had yum on one and you got you want to use that on yep. another one. Right. Right. What's 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 conceptually, what's the difference between a role and then saying mm -hmm. like a data? <clears throat> What you do in one and not the other? Um. So, difference between like a set of tasks for a particular thing and a machine. <coughs> like a data server is the machine, a data task is set up. So the group says, here are my data servers, and so the database role says, what to do on that? Right, they are linked. Like the, the roles that you would run against a group um, are, you know, there's, there's kind of a one-to-many mapping there, or many-to-many -many mapping there. Um, but you said the roles are typically groups of tasks yep. versus the groups of groups of the machine. Right, so, so when I talk about groups, I'm talking about inventory groups. When I talk about roles, I'm talking about a list of tasks. And I can, um, can I show you quickly. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's look at my vagrant. My vagrant, uh, my vagrant playbook. So this, remember, these are um, this vagrant installation is a single machine version of our application. Usually our, our application spans multiple machines, multiple database servers, multiple web servers, all behind load balancers and all those things, right? So I have three different groups of hosts. I have DB servers, um, in this case it's Mongo for, for storing some metadata. Web servers, which is Nginx plus our application our web application level code and then CC9 servers, which is our in-house um, number crunching database. I'm going to run sudo because I'm going to connect as a as vagrant user instead of as a root user, as I would normally do with EC2. Um, my roles here, I have a common role that gets applied to every machine no matter what. Now those are things like set the host name. There's a, in Ubuntu, there's a Python apt um, repository tool that I need to have on the box in order to add new repositories um, or to add, add GPG keys to the, to the signing, signing key ring. Um, crunched here, this is all stuff that I need to have on the box in order to deploy any crunch software. So it's a Python virtual environment setup. It's a... Um, it creates the directory that everything lands in, that kind of stuff. The DB tier sets up Mongo and everything associated with Mongo. The ZZ9 tier sets up our in-house database and everything associated with that. A data storage tier is actually applied either on the DB tier or the ZZ9 tier, and that's my database scripts. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's my, this stuff, this machine has stuff that I care about and is not just transient data. And then I have a web tier to handle the, the setup of Nginx and the web application layer. 
and I have a, a separate role just for vagrants, so I can install some debuggers and run if you've got if you have a, if you have checkouts of our software, it'll run it'll put those checkouts in your virtual environment instead of the system packages. Um, so just some niceties involved in, in being a developer. Okay. So each of these roles translates to a tasks file that gets executed in order, but they all match these hosts. Right? And if I had a sing if I had a multi mach multiple machine um, playbook, then it would look like host DB servers, and then it would just have common <coughs> crunch tier, DB tier, CZ9 tier, or DB, D, DB tier and data storage tier. If I just wanted web servers, I would have common crunch tier, web tier. If I wanted just ZZ9 servers, I'd have common ZZ9 tier and data storage tier. Right, that would be that would be the only difference in those those in that environment. And I could put all of those in the same in the same playbook file, um, and they would execute in parallel um, from your. <coughs> all of the right commands would be executed against the right sets of hosts based on your inventory group structure. Okay. Can you stop to serialize instead of going to parallel? Yes. You can set the number of connections that it will make. Um, okay, this is cut off at the bottom. <laughs> I'll read it to you later. Um, you control minus. Nope. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's changing the little counter in the top right. Yeah. <laughs> That's weird. It's getting smaller. <laughs> okay. Um, so tasks are designed to be item potent. Which means if you run them multiple times, you'll have the same result. Um, that lets you rerun these scripts when something fails or something breaks in the middle. Just tweak the script, tweak the playbook, and run it again. Um, task described generally a desired state, not the steps to take to get there. Um, and then the, the module that gets run does the actual heavy lifting. Um, and the module is a repeatable, uh, well, we'll get there. <laughs> All right, so this is a task. It's start nginx. It says at the bottom, service colon, name equals nginx, state equals running. It says at the end of my, at, when this task is finished running, I can be sure that either the script has failed or nginx is running. And the module itself handles all of the polling that would be necessary in order to check service return codes or um, it, there are a bunch of options to the service module that you um, make this as, as rich or as thorough as you'd like it to be. Um, so modules take care of all the error code checking, um, all of the state transitions, like what happens if NGINX is not started versus what happens when NGINX is already running, right? Um, handles all of those, those state transitions to get you to the point. So it's like you have multiple possible inputs of what the service state is, but at the end of the module run, I want one state that is where I am. Um, it, and then it detects whether changes have, have happened or not. For example, if I'm dropping a new, a new line in a, in a file, if nothing changes, then, then I get a changed equals no in, in Ansible, and then notifications don't actually happen. There's a bunch of built-in modules. Um, I want to say like 60 built-in modules including stuff for Amazon EC2 and ELBs and S3 and, and all those stuff. There's um, cloud, uh, 
their open ocean and a bunch of other cloud providers are already built in. Um, there are modules for interfacing with EasyDNS and with um, a bunch of other uh, third party service providers, network service providers. Um, there's also a marketplace for these modules so you can create your own and upload them to this galaxy, the Ansible galaxy. So you can download, um, for example, the built-in, I just learned this, the built-in Yelp module uses, um, uses extra strict package checking because it just, it just shells out to Yum, I think, at, at, at the end. Um, but some guy said, I don't need that. I control all of the package infrastructure, so just, just install it. He says it's much faster. But, um, okay, so now conditional tests. And this gets into where, what you would do for, um, for your different distributions. So this is when you're within a task, defining a task. Right. So these are keys that you can add to a task to say, do this multiple times with these different parameters. In the case of a when, um, or actually a when is a, is a check. Is, is this value true? Then do it. If not, skip it. Um, there's, and then there are several different ways to get lists to operate on. Um, with file goes through line by line in a file. For example, here I have I have all of the public SSH keys for all of my developers, so that they have uh, so I can push those to our development servers. So for testing in QA, they all have shell access. They can all get in and debug and whatever they need to do, um, and that just lives in in my Ansible playbook, Ansible repository. And I push those in every time I run my Ansible scripts. And if somebody leaves the company, I just remove them from that list, and they're gone the next time it runs. Um, I have a file log, so you can say for every item in this directory, that's a local directory. Um, there's with items, which lets you just specify a list, and then sequence lets you um, specify, you know. Uh, like a for loop, let's say, run from zero to numprox, which we calculated earlier. Yes, Scott. Can you drop a script on our machine and use the output or the result of that script in your yes. testing and so forth? Uh, there's also a register command. You can um, you can register the output from what whatever. What if I have a script that happens to tell me? what specific OS it is, and I'm talking about it's pretty broad to a lot of different OSs. And it works on every single OS out there. Okay, so it would so you would say register variable name, and then that variable name becomes available in all your subsequent tasks. Okay. And it, you would say variable.standard out would give you, you know, the standard output. Register, or um, your register variable <coughs> dot, <coughs> Erno, I think, is the is the like the exit code, and there there are a bunch of parameters. Um, okay, any questions about this? Yes. This may be how you do it. If you have a set of tasks running for each machine, uh -huh. but there was nothing in there that said what happens if it doesn't work successfully. In other words, if you went and installed the latest level. Mm -hmm. And for some reason it couldn't do it, or it could do it with exception. Or the next step you're going to go start something, well, if it starts but then dies, how do you handle that? Is it with these kind of things? And you have to pick up some kind of return code and say, what's the return code is this? Yeah, so every, every task runs module code. Module code has, a, a, depending on the module, can have lots and lots of different error checkings mm -hmm. or none at all. <laughs> I mean, it depends on who developed the module. For those well-used modules like installing software and restarting services, it's going to work. If something doesn't work, the script exits out okay. and tells you why. Okay, so it, it quits. It, it quits, yeah. Um, 
Uh, it tries to handle all of the error cases that it knows about, but if it doesn't work, it quits. It doesn't try to keep going. Um, and if you're running this against a bunch of servers and only one fails, then that one will drop out. All the rest will continue. And I've seen people with the script before where they pick up like a return code kind of thing and say if the return code is greater right. than this, then fail, but if it's less than this, don't. I'll show you that at the end. <laughs> You're going to have to run really fast here if you're trying to get through this. Um, one, other, one other question. Okay. With some products, you're going to change changing system variables. Or system, then you have to go in and change like, how many shared segments you can have or how much shared memory and things like that. Which is okay if you have one of them. Like you have one Oracle database, so one in your backup or something. Mm -hmm. But I've seen times where system admins sometimes, you know, they'll be set for one product and then another guy will come in and install the other product and he will say, ah, I got to add this. How do you handle that? Do you set local close variables for that special thing? I set a task that says set the number of shared memory segments to this value. But well, what if you have two roles on one machine and each one set? And they have yeah. they have yeah. it. <laughs> Doctor, it hurts no. when I do this. Don't do they, that. <laughs> you will always know in which order that stuff will run. But you still you never you don't want to hard code it. You want to Yeah, you want to set it in variables. You don't want to set that in in the task. Right, but it would have to be host specific, I guess, because some do that and some don't. I, I guess what it doesn't have to might be five here and four here, but if they're both in Hitting that role, you need seven. Use a max. Max is available. It's Python. Just you know. If, I um, think they should each have their own VM. <laughs> <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't always work that way. Though. You bid the boss uh, and ask for a while you're budget increase for a whole other server. And if if you're doing uh, quick cycles on on your playbooks as you're developing them, you want to set up tags. This lets you run lets you skip a bunch of tasks or only run a, a handful of tasks that you really are interested in at the moment. Um, you can specify multiple tags per task. Um, you can specify them in any of these three ways. If you need more than one tag, you need either the, the second or the third. You can't just say deploy comma staging or deploy comma update or you need to use the, the bracket terminology that bit me before. Calling that out to you. Um, and then add my other question about the multiple specifications in that one. If you're using when on a bunch of tasks, like if you got operator specific tasks, factor those out and then have a, a single when clause that says when OS equals Ubuntu, uh -huh. include this That's other YAML thing. file, which is all of the tasks for Ubuntu. <laughs> When the OS equals Fedora, then include this other that's, file. That's what I was saying. Right, so there are includes. Um, you can you can make these as fine grained or as as complicated as you need. Um, I use them also to string a, a set of tasks together that kind of act as a logical unit. Like for example, after I start my service, sometimes you know developers like to slip in code that just doesn't. Like you know, the server won't start, you know that kind of thing. So I, I, one of the modules that Ansible provides to me is a check this port to see if something's listening on it, and time out after a period of time. Um, and so I can, I have a safe restart that I can execute at the end of my process that will um, handle the entire stack. Templates, I'm going to just race through this. Um, templates have are, are in Jinja format. Um, there's a link in my presentation. I'll post a link in the, in the on the mailing list so that you can click on it at your own discrepan or discretion. Um, basically, it says anything in these special curly bracket structures gets replaced with Python code or a variable replacement. Um, you can do four loop six statements. All your variables are available. All your facts are available. Uh, you can do some fun stuff there. When 
Now, if when you get stuck, remember these things. Use a tag so you can iterate quickly. Um, use the debug module for looking at those variables that you set but you don't know what the structure are because you know they're a little opaque. Or to look at those facts that you don't know the structure of because they're a little opaque. And then dash v, 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 extra, extra verbose. In the end, your project should probably look something like this. Um, you'd have an inventory structure that would have your entire um, ecosystem set up in various groups and variables and those kinds of things. You'll have a set of roles. Each role will have a name, which is that next level down. Inside there, you'll have files that are available to copy over. Like these would be configura configuration files that are that don't have any variables in them, um, like or startup scripts or you know other kinds of stuff that will come down automatically. Handlers uh, and the name here, main.yaml, is is special, which means if I if I say handlers and then list a name a, a role name. Then those are the ones that are that I'm mean that I'm talking about. Tasks, uh, main.yaml again is that's that's these are the main tasks that get in, that get invoked when that role is pulled. Templates is a special directory that has template files for using the Jinja syntax to replace variables and those kinds of things. Um, library then is at the top level again. That's where you can put your custom modules when you write your own Ansible modules. Um, and then at the top level, you would have those set of playbooks that might uh, differentiate your environments or, or whatever you need to do. I tend to have kind of a set of system level Ansible playbooks. And then I have some others just you know throwaways or, or quick one -offs. Quick one-offs that I, you know, if I need to do some kind of one-time maintenance tax, or I, I think I need to do it one time, but I end up needing to do it more than once. <laughs> um, for example, I've got a database reset script that um, will can be run through Jenkins to reset our database, our development database once a week, once a week, so we can start, so that doesn't fill up with data or. We don't have to worry too much about migration scripts, at least at that level. Okay. I'm going to show it to you. I'm not going to actually run it. Um, no, 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 no. Live demo. <laughs> okay, so this is a rather involved Playbook. What we're doing here is we are firing up EC2 instances. They happen to be spot instances. We're specifying the instance type, the spot price, what image to load, what kernel to use, and the tags to use on that EC2 instance. Um, we're telling it where to go, US West 2, and we're telling it to wait until that launches. So that's what that first chunk does. Okay. At the top here, I'm just defining some um, playbook level role or variables that I happen to just be looking up from the environment because that was the easiest way to get this data into the script. Um, and I have Jenkins set up to give me parameters so I can actually use the drop down to say, I want to try this on the M3 2x large instance size. And I want my spot price to be 20 cents instead of 40 cents or whatever, you know. Um, so all of these can be set, are set up in my, my Jenkins job so that this can be run every night so we can make sure that we're not getting slower <laughs> as over time as our code base increases. We actually want to see our numbers drop as we optimize. Okay. Um, okay, so here's the next little magic bit. I'm going to add each instance that's launched into this um, group name launched. I think that's a, a, a new variable. It's been defined. It is the it's a dynamic 
inventory, if you will, of for this new instance. This is a new thing that I've created in this script. I'm going to register it here. And I'm going to do that for every item. In, so, so let's see. Do I, did I specifically register that? Yes. So here's the register here. I'm registering this EC2 variable. And then I'm iterating over that EC2 variable dot instances in order to add these things to the dynamic <coughs> inventory. I'm going to debug. This is that the debug module that's so helpful because that EC2 registered variable is so opaque. I'm going to print it out so I know what I actually pulled down. Then I'm going to wait for SSH to come up for every instance that, that was launched. Okay. New playbook. All in the same file. I'm going to, with the hosts that are in that new launched group that I just set up, I'm going to not sudo. I'm going to gather facts. I'm going to use these variables. And I'm going to use these roles. Those roles should look familiar. Uh, those are the roles I used in my vagrant script. And they're the, the roles that I use in my, in my production script. Um, but I have a special tag here for setup so that I can just run the setup. I don't actually have to complete the rest of it. I can actually, I actually have a job in Jenkins to say, you know, I have a, I have a, a sales engineer who needs a system. I can push a button at Jenkins and it'll launch this and cut out after setup is done. It won't run the benchmarks, but it'll just leave that server running. And so they can connect to it um, it's got a self-signed certificate on it, and demo, whatever they need to. And then turn it off when they're done. And just shut down. Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> okay, better. Um, all right, so now that I've got all of my software stack configured, I've got a new playbook that's going to load some fixture data. This is a big, giant data set that I am going to copy into place, um, kind of like a, a database re restore. And that's not terribly interesting, but um, at the end, I'm going to restart the database, restore my Mongo. OK, now I'm going to new playbook. I'm going to create and run those benchmarks. Those benchmarks are going to run from my local machine or in the case of Jenkins, it's going to run from Jenkins. It's going to run code locally. It will connect to my remote EC2 instance, run these benchmarks, and register the results in this test output. I'm going to ignore errors because, you know, sometimes developers push code that doesn't quite work. Um, and I actually need to continue running at this point. Right. I need to continue running so I can terminate this instance. Um, so I'm going to ignore the errors here, but I'm going to keep track of what happened so that I can check it later and fail the whole system after the cleanup happens. Okay. Uh, again, I'm doing with items, so I could have I could specify multiple instances. I could say um, run it on an M3 X large, M3 2 X large, M3 4 X large, and have them all running in parallel. Not that I'd want to do that, but I could. Um, then here I'm going to terminate all those launched instances, new playbook. Um, again, I'm on localhost instead of running remotely. And this is the local action to run the EC2 module. Um, state is absent. Absent means terminated in this particular case. And it gives the instance ID that has been registered in the first step. Um, and then finally, I'm going to um, check that the test result was successful, and if so, I will <coughs> exit cleanly. If not, I'm going to fail loudly. Benchmarks failed. And then print the standard out and standard error so I can debug. So that's already, already in my Jenkins log, so I can just review it. And all told, this takes 
about 22 minutes um, because of the variable variability in how fast Amazon approves those spot instance requests mostly. Um, but it's automated, it happens every night, and I get emails when it breaks. Questions? Ah, there you go. Counterclockwise. T-shirt. Exactly. Can you show us a module? I will show you later. <laughs> yes? So what you're saying is you don't need to have a server installed. You can just basically log in with your credentials and then execute the command. Is that correct? When, you could, when you're running into one of, on a remote machine? Uh -huh. So, you, but you can copy whatever you so need. So what it there. needs, what it needs on the remote system is Python 2.4 or later. Okay, and so then but you can Python you can install on that remote machine whatever you need. Correct? So yes. Through Ansible. Mm -hmm. So you can make an Ansible work. Yes. Okay. So basically, it drops everything it needs via SSH. Onto it that. uses your SSH keys locally. So Ansible can just, you can make an Ansible instance that will then just make more copies of itself across any machine it finds. <laughs> yes. Kind of like what Robert Morris did. If, it had, <laughs> keys, if, it, had, if it had your keys in it, yes. If the instance you launched had your keys in it, then yes, it goes to do that. So, what you're saying is having that So, uh, use. <laughs> Use EC2's I am to specify some <laughs> user credentials. I'm not thinking about that. There, there are other ways to protect against that kind of thing. Okay, I have more hands up. Yes. How long does it take to bring up your uh, developer stack on paper? Uh, it's a go grab a cup of coffee. Uh, it's, it's like a lot faster than bringing up the ten minutes. Production than AMI, I think. Ten minutes, I think. Go, yeah. go bug your coworker and talk about football. The, the full production deployment takes eight minutes from my local machine to the remote. If I was local to local, if I was remote to remote, like if I SSH'd into a remote box and then ran the deployment, I think it'd probably be about four or five minutes, but I have something like, um, I don't know, 200, 300 tasks that happen. How much should yeah, you get out with Docker and it's screaming fast? Yeah. The binance with Docker is going pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah. How much data is that dropping for your average install? Not enough to worry about. I mean, are we talking like less than 100 megs or? Yeah. Okay, I got it. Yes? What's been your biggest frustration? Variable structure. Not knowing what the variable looks like. But this debug command basically fixes that. Fixes that. Uh, the other thing that's been really hassling to me is you know, some of the tools that I've, we've chosen to use are not really ready to be used as prime time tools. So, for example, if, I don't know if you use Supervisor. It's, it's a great idea, but it's not, it's not bulletproof. So, so, I have lots of boilerplate around restarting Supervisor tasks. It's kind of piggybacking on tasks. Um, if you could add one thing to the feature set that Ansible does, what would you add? Already did. <laughs> yeah. So Ansible didn't have uh, spot instance okay. stuff. I wrote a patch, submitted it, and they pulled my patch request two, a month ago. Um, the other stuff that I needed, uh, so uh, I'll do it. <laughs> So this is a module that I wrote. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Runs a command periodically until a timeout or until it returns a successful error code. Like, for example, if you wanted to um, make sure that not only are you listening to the port, but I'm going to wget against it and make sure that I get a 403 error. You know, that says, the um, I'm waiting for authentication versus a 502, which says the proxy didn't. The proxy server can't talk to the backend. Um, so I run this wait for command after restarting my application to make sure that those devs didn't sneak something in that um, causes the thing for it to crash. Um, Who are these evil devs of which you speak? <laughs> <laughs> Remember retiring. <laughs> <laughs> well, yesterday I couldn't spell engineer, today I are one. 
Uh, no, I, I want a bowl. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's okay. So, um, modules can actually be shell code. They don't have to be Python, but uh, we like Python. Um, we basically operate on a uh, standard in, standard out execution module with known set of parameters. Or if it's a Python module, you are, you implement a class a class interface um, that's well known, good documentation. <coughs> um, so before I got into Ansible, I had no idea how to use EC2 for one-off type tasks. Fire something up, run stuff against it. Tear it all down. Used to I, before I got into Ansible, I thought that you had to build all of this infrastructure around how do I fetch my data, how do I um, connect one machine to another, you know, how do I make it interop interop with the world. But with Ansible, I can drive it remotely. I can drive it remotely from a system that runs tasks periodically. <laughs> Um, and it's, I think it's really cool, it's really cool. There are some headaches getting into it. I think I've given you the pieces of information that you need. Um, if not, I'm happy to answer questions. Will you be at Vada? That depends on my carpool. <laughs> so I don't know. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> Wait. There's some good questions now. 42. 42, yeah, 42. What size are they? I have a medium, I have a large, and I have an XL. <laughs> well, those are good. So if, that's, <laughs> so if that doesn't apply to you, do not answer. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right, what two things? Should a group, what, 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 along what two lines should a group follow? Are we not a good question? Oh, yeah, yes. I got the function. Yeah, uh, it's like the application <laughs> and the geography. Good. What size do you need? Uh, whatever you got, fine. What? Large. Yes. <laughs> <large. laughs> <laughs> oh, I almost got that. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> Huh? <laughs> yeah, they're American apparel, so they're gonna run small. Do <laughs> <laughs> you have a medium and an XL left? Is that correct? So I have a yes, a large and then an XL. A large and an XL. Yes, but they'll run a size small. So, so medium. So you might want to switch. <laughs> okay. Um, What's the name of the directory that uh, files that have variable replacement in them go in? So what's the name of the directory that, that, that files that can't have variable replacement in them, where, what's Templates. the name? Yes. Templates. Templates. Okay. Large or something. All right. Um, What's the name of the company I work for? <laughs> yes. Yeah. You should say that louder. Huh? You should say that louder. Crunch.io. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.